which only see me with it. Wonderful, how are you? I'm gonna have my mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's not feeling well. No, speaking of six, 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 six. I guess it brought up the ham. Oh dear, should I move? No, I'm oh, okay. Just <laughs> <laughs> asking. They don't allow. All right. Do you want to gavel us in? I'm, I'm okay. <clears throat> okay, we're gonna call this uh, meeting of the uh, uh, Building Energy Transition Task Force to order. Um, I am the co-chair, uh, Paul Pinsky, and I'm joined by the deputy secretary. Uh, we'll be joined by the secretary at some point. Uh, she's at another required uh, participation, uh, another private thing. So um, this is, what, the seventh or whatever. It's uh, we've had a few of these meetings, and we're getting close to the end. Um, uh, obviously, uh, everyone has received the agenda and um and the recommendations that we're going to take up uh today let me make one or two quick comments and i'll um uh pass uh the gavel on some of you uh, track other activities that are going on i can tell you this week i have um, the the building uh, energy transition task force tomorrow is a solar incentive task force and on thursday is the Maryland Climate Commission. It's a busy week for myself and the secretary. Um, and as we all know, uh, the Department of the Environment has been working diligently over time uh, on the implementation plan for the Climate Solutions Now Act, which will be coming out in four to six weeks or whenever. The point I want to make is this. Um, there is some overlap. Um, and again, I haven't seen the plan. Uh, that will be coming out, like I said, in four to six weeks. Uh, I serve on the Climate Commission, and there are a number of proposals that are being discussed and voted on. And as you will see, there are a number today. Some are overlapping. Some uh, were generated by the uh, interim report from the um, School of Public Policy uh, uh, Global what are they called? Uh, Center, Center, for for Global. Center for Global Sustainability. Center for Global Sustainability. Matt Holtman uh, at the University of Maryland. So don't be surprised. I mean, these are three different processes, but they obviously are dealing with much of the same issue, and that's the decarbonization and how we're going to hit uh, our required goals uh, in the state of Maryland. And as many of you know, even the uh, building energy transition came out of the Climate Solutions Now Act. So, you know, it's it's somewhat inbred, if, if you will. Um, so today we're going to take up some issues. We want to be transparent. Uh, we don't want you to hold back. We're going to vote on things, and and you should state if you like or don't like something. And it's okay for people to disagree. Uh, at the end of the day, though, we believe in a small d democratic process. We're going to have recommendations. And we will end up with a report that we will submit uh, to the governor and to the legislature, hopefully for them to act on uh, many of the recommendations. Uh, with that, Ms. Dorsey. Thank you. So Suzanne Dorsey, Deputy Secretary, MDE, uh, substituting just for a short time until the secretary arrives. And um, I know that you're picking up from where you were last time, uh, finalizing the recommendations. And um, today we're going to discuss the feedback that you submitted since the last meeting and decide on the final edits to the draft recommendations. So the final meeting is scheduled for November 28th, which is when you will vote on the final report. And just as a reminder, the, the report is due on December 1st. So um, with that, I'd like to send it over to Alex. That's all right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Director and Deputy Secretary. Uh, my name again is Cliff Majerzyk. I am with the Institute for Market Transformation, and we are helping uh, support this task force process and uh, facilitating task force meetings. Um, so uh, thank you all again for your participation. Uh, so uh, we have uh, a um, short agenda, but I think um, we'll have a lot to talk about. Um, let me try and share my screen.
hopefully everyone can now see my screen, yes. Uh, so uh, on the agenda is uh, an overview of the final, um, the task force's final report, um, an outline and of the process, uh, an outline of the report and the process. Um, and then the, the majority of our time will be spent discussing our draft priority recommendations, and hopefully we'll be able to basically take the draft off of them. Um, hopefully at the end of today, we will have uh, final priority recommendations, um, and those will go into our report. Um, and to the extent that there is um, a, a lack of consensus on any items, we'll identify those, uh, and if necessary, we'll take votes. But my hope is that um, we won't have to take very many votes. Uh, and then at the end of this meeting, as always, there is time for public comments. That is time when not the people who are not members of the task force will be invited to, to make comments on the process. So um, with that, um, I want to remind folks um, that this task force is one of our first items of business um, agreed on principles, guiding principles to guide how uh, we should prioritize investments, um, you know, what is most important um, for this task force to keep in mind as we're deciding what to recommend um, to the state. Uh, and the top recommendation that uh, per the vote of this task force was to drive early action. Uh, of course, we have a climate crisis and the Climate Solutions Now Act was intended to address that climate price crisis, so urgency is important. Uh, the, the, second recommend, the second principle was um, to focus on equity and housing security, making sure that we're avoiding displacement, making sure that frontline communities, which are already overburdened by a history of systemic racism, that we're not adding to the burden on them, and then hopefully we're actually lightening that burden. And lastly, cost effectiveness, and that was defined both narrowly and, and broadly, accounting for things like the social cost of carbon. So we should keep these in mind in everything that we do, including our discussions today. So here is a look at the draft report um, outline. Uh, and um, you know, we, time is very limited. Um, as we heard from the deputy secretary, uh, this report is due to uh, the governor and the legislature by December 1st. Uh, and so the intention is that we're gonna have a vote on it on the 28th uh, and you'll be seeing it shortly. And I'll share that the, um, the timeline with you on the next slide. Um, uh, but this is um, our thought as to what will be in that report. Um, there will be first a letter from the co-chairs um, providing context and explanation, then a short one or two page executive summary. Uh, and we know of course that some folks will mostly focus on the executive summary. Um, and then um, an introduction, um, which will be three or four pages. Uh, with process, uh, pr you know, the fact that the Climate Solutions Now Act created this task force and gave it a charge, uh, and we'll overview the, the process that we've gone through uh, over the, this uh, last several months since June, um, including the work of the full task force and the four subgroups. The policy context, the guiding principles, the top three of which I just shared with you, um, the definition of uh, what is a building energy transition um, and um, how does that relate to things like electrification. Uh, general themes um, that cross all building types. Uh, remember, we broke into four subgroups, each addressing their own, um, uh, their own building types, but there are certain themes that we saw that crossed every um, building group. Uh, and then the priority recommendations, which we're going to be devoting the majority of our meeting today to, um, which will be provided in full in, in the uh, report um, with a short narrative added um, to sort of provide context at the top of each um, recommendation. Um, and uh, then additional recommendations that the subgroups came up with, but um, didn't sort of make the cut as part of the, um, the priority recommendations. Um, and then a cost and funding needs summary, uh, looking at how much uh, money is going to be need, need to be invested to accomplish the transition, the building energy transition, and the recommendations of this task force. And then two appendices, um, one um, breaking out uh, the subgroups and describing you know, what types of buildings each subgroup addressed, uh, and another, the technical analyses that have been presented to this task force from AECOM, LBNL, that's Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, and Pacific Northwest National Labs, those are both federal um, labs supported by the U.S. Department of Energy, 
uh, and rewiring America. So we've heard presentations from them and we'll, their, their presentations as well as some backup uh, documents will be included in appendices. And then um, the list of task force members and acknowledgements, acknowledgements of folks who have been helpful to us um, as we have worked on this. Uh, this a report will be uh, shared with you um, in draft. Um, we are hoping that it will be shared with you in just two days. Um, and um, that uh, you'll have from uh, November 9th until November 15th to um, give us feedback. And you know this is you know this is very late in the process. So we're not looking for new su suggestions. We are looking for you know clarifying edits, wordsmithing, um, and um, very specific recommendations. Don't say, I don't like this. If you don't like it, tell us what could be done to make it better. Exactly, word for word, so that we can cut and paste. Um, and, uh, and also, if there's anything that you really don't like that would prevent you from being able to support the final proposal, definitely let us know about that. We would like to have a unanimous vote in support of this task force pr proposal. That vote will take place um, hopefully on November 28th, where we will be sitting here for another meeting like this. And before the end of that meeting, we'll all be asked to take a vote, yay or nay, and we'd love to get unanimous yays. Um, the final report, based on that feedback that you all uh, give us, will be delivered back to the task force on November 22nd. So incorporating feedback that we've gotten from the task force. And so you'll have almost a week to review it before we ask you to vote on it on the 28th. So that is the process. Um, any questions about that before I move on? Okay, great. Um, so um, that is the end of this slide deck. Uh, and now we get into the meat of this meeting, which is to talk about the priority recommendations, um, the draft priority recommendations. Uh, and I just want to call those folks who are online attention to the fact that Secretary McElwain has joined us. Do you want to say anything more? Um, you've been ably represented in your absence. Hello, let's get started. <laughs> Good to see you all in person and ones of you who are online. Hello, hello. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So let's see here. I need to change how I'm sharing. Um, Please bear with me for a moment while I pull up the priority recommendations. All right. Hopefully everyone um, can now see these priority recommendations. Um, so I'm gonna start at the top of the document, which is what we've already discussed in prior meetings. And we have a lot to cover. Uh, there's some new information here that uh, you all haven't seen before. So, if you um, yeah, make use it. this Zoom, just so it can be a yeah. little larger on the screen. I'll make it bigger for everybody to see. Thank you. The, um, yeah, there we go. <laughs> and let's see if I can hide some of this here. Um, all right. Um, so, uh, we've already talked about our workforce development priority recommendation. There are no changes to that from the prior uh, meeting. So I'm just going to proceed because we have a lot to cover. Um, if anybody has any concerns about that, raise your hand now. Um, but, um, I think that should be settled. Um, the, the clean energy transition hub, um, it, we've had some discussion, uh, there was broad consensus. One question that has not been fully addressed, if we have a, um, we had a three to $10 million um, budget item in here. Um, and I think that there hasn't been agreement on that figure. And I'm wondering if anybody wants to say more uh, on that point. Yes, please, Director Pinsky. Thank you, Cliff. Um, as I've shared, uh, we have hired the first hub, hub coordinator leader, Ms. Price. Um, and we are trying to shape and form what that position will do. Uh, in the original legislation, the Climate Solutions Now Act, I think it was about a paragraph uh, setting up that department or that uh, unit, if you will. Um, I'm concerned 
three to ten million dollars is a lot of money. And from what I hear from the second floor, uh, the budget proposal for um, 24, 25 is going to be a lot tighter and more stringent. That revenue is going to be down. Cents are going to be up. And, you know, I'm not one for always being realistic. But when it comes to uh, uh, fiscal responsibility, uh, working for the second floor, I think we have to defer to the concerns and interest. So, you know, we haven't set up a budget yet. We're actually, and, and Becky Price start, set up a memo of what types of things this hub will do. Um, how many people takes and how much we want to ask the, the governor and the budget for, I think it's up in the air. I, I think three to $10 million is a major, major leap. Um, and I guess I would like to ratchet that down. I mean, even bringing that down to a million dollars, you know, that that would be um, eight more positions and a couple hundred thousand for consulting. Um, and I'm not sure we're ready to say what those positions will be yet. So I, you know, using my uh, fiscally conservative hat, I guess I would suggest us uh, we reduce the ask. On so I reduce it to one million, not a range, a single number, right? Yeah, I, you know, look, if, if I could say why, but it's really just bringing it down. And I, I don't know how long it'll take us to transition and build up the hub. And I think ultimately it's got to be bigger. Um, but I think we have to be clear on what we can do and what we should do before we go too far in the future. Can you make that notation that in the future, as this ramps up, it will be increased? How about need it? How about something like appropriate um, uh, beginning at $1 million per year uh, and ramping up through 2045? Yeah, uh, as the program develops or something. Okay. Yeah. I'll try to try to crack it, typing that in real time. Um, does anyone want to speak to that? Yes, please. My, I was just going to say my concern, and you know better, certainly you know what your budget is, but asking only for $1 million is you aren't setting, this is the, the goal, you know, this is the, the vision, you know, visionary. This is what we think we can possibly need. So you ask what you think you need and you'll get what you're going to get. I mean, I that's kind of a perspective. That let, let me do a quick response and then have uh, okay. the, my co-chair. The task force is an independent body and should do what it feels necessary. As someone who works for the governor, I guess I feel a little bit uh, obligation to be a little bit respectful of, of knowing that the budget for the year two or three right. is going to be tamped down. You know, I just don't know what the right number is. So, right. look, it's it, I've proposed it. It's up to the task force. If the task force wants to amend it, they can. I just am on record. No, I, I think I, it's, sorry. I see first. Um, I I agree with well first I understand where you're coming from I get that and it's true you know you ask for what you want and you land where you know where you need to right but me too as a, a cabinet member I have to tell you um yeah um it's tight and I what I don't want to see is they look at this and just go oh no just just ignore that one. but at this price tag on here that's what would happen probably. And we don't want them to ignore it. So, and we wanna just think about what exactly are we saying here without the money? We're saying expand the program as appropriate, right? And make sure that it is funded. So we could be general, it's still a recommendation that, you know, in order for us to be successful, we need to make sure we have this hub because you know, they can literally come back and say, where'd you get $1 million from? Like you can't just pull numbers out as well, right? So that's why I'm thinking that, and I and I am because I know very well the budget picture. I wouldn't even say one million. I I would just take that amount out, period, and just say, you know, that this needs to con have continuous funding. Because don't forget, we are not giving recommendations on how to fund these things. So we're just throwing stuff out with no money attached to it 
no ideas. And, and, you know, I did see some financing. So unless we agree on a path forward on financing, I just think it would be a little tough. So uh, I would take the number out altogether and just highlight the fact that we need to make sure that it is funded. Or if we had to pick a number, it would be just enough to pay for two FTEs, two pins or something for right now. But you only have one now. Correct. And, and who's paying for that? Me? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I don't want my partner to negotiate against me. <laughs> Situation. <laughs> I know. I also deal with the budget, though, and I do know in this climate, they do like, they will ask that question if you throw the number out there. Uh, but even if you say it's got to be funded, they're going to ask that question too, coming back from the second floor. Funding, what do you mean funding? So if you have some kind of number, even if it's lower than that, even if it's, what's that? I'm sorry. I We're was, thinking of a funding idea. Right. Well, that's great. <laughs> um, but also, like, if you put in there as this program, you know, ramps up or escalates or, or grows, you know, this will have to be revisited. You know, yeah. staffing will have to be revisited. And when you spoke about pins, is it a possibility that uh, like we do with the DGS sometimes, we get pins from other agencies. If they want to have a program, we just did that with MDH. They wanted us to um, oversee their master their master plan. So we said, hey, we need somebody here to do that. Give us a pin. Pin was transferred to us. We have to fund it, but we have a pin now. You know, pins are hard to come by. That possibly we have to throw that out there that we asked for with you know, whoever the major players in this may have to provide, you know, give a little blood to the calls too. Yeah. You get your pin that way. Just thought. A thought. Any other ideas on that? Just to decipher the jargon, second floor is a reference to the governor's office Sorry. staff and <laughs> the uh, <laughs> and, and pins, pins are state uh, state yeah. positions. Yeah. Just, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> private sector we still figured it out. Yeah, I, I think you all look like you were ahead of us. <laughs> So how do we move forward on this uh, conversation? Um, if you can't, I think I would encourage you two to reach agreement. If you don't want to reach agreement, we could put it to a vote um, or we could put a pin in it and address <laughs> it later. Oh, we don't have later. We? Well, we have a little room. All right, you want to you want to agree to two pins for uh, pins? How about we split the difference? That's about the equivalent to two pins. Five hundred thousand. Anyway. <laughs> what is it? What would you want to split it to? Five hundred thousand. Okay. Um, that won't scare them as much, but it still right. will. But I think that's a less of a blow. Uh, does anyone in the task force ha have anything you want to say about that, or can we accept that and move on? I just say include the, the suggested language of ramping up in the future because yeah, mm -hmm. Becky's got all kinds of plans. So <laughs> there, there is language here now. Uh, it, it reads: it would read appropriate beginning at five hundred thousand each year and ramping up as programs develop through 2045 to scale up the MEA climate transition and clean energy hub created by the Climate Solutions Now Act. Is that okay? Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to accept these changes. Um, okay. Uh, so when do we vote on these things? Um, we don't need to have votes unless we don't reach consensus. Um, so oh, to the extent that, that there's no objections, we're not having votes. Yeah, the, oh. the objective for today's meeting is we work through any of the last wordsmithing uh, changes that you want to make to the recommendations and bring everything forward as final draft recommendations for your final vote in the November, November 28th meeting. And that'll be the, the vote to approve the report and and recommendations all together. Ah, so we will vote on it. Okay, yeah. got it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so now we're going to move on to the one-stop shop. And I just want to um, give folks a heads up that Nicola, who's um, the task force member from uh, DHCD, unfortunately has to participate in a um, empower hearing today. So she can't be here for this uh, meeting. Um, but we do have a DHCD um, representative. Uh, and I just um, invite um, that representative to um, speak in a moment. Uh, I'll describe what we have here and then 
Uh, it's largely unchanged from what we've previously agreed to. We had left a um, sort of blank for GHCD to fill in around the budget. Um, and um, they've come back with a range of 3.5 to 4.2 million dollars in annual funding. Um, and uh, a suggestion from uh, OPC um, is that uh, we point out that the funding should be distinct from Empower and uh, should be free of Empower's constraints. Uh, importantly, Empower has constraints around cost effectiveness that are probably not a good fit for the one-stop shop and for uh, limited income housing. Um, and then we just um, tweak the wording a little bit, the red text here, like the OSS will, it's just sort of slip, simplifying the wording. Um, and there was, uh, we added uh, and or facilitate based on a suggestion. Um, I can't remember now who suggested that. Um, and um, just uh, again, tweak the wording here around consulting with a healthy, green and healthy task force. Not a substantive change, these are just wording changes. Um, the, the biggest substantive change is this uh, insertion of the budget figure. Uh, so now I'd like to invite the DHCD rep if there's any additional color you'd like to add. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Zachary Rockwell uh, with DHCD. And I think the only thing I'd want to add is, you know, in regards to that estimate um, that was specifically taken from uh, the navigator legislative language is kind of how that number was come to. Um, so that would be the only a little bit of extra context I'd like to add. And I think to, to be to clarify, I mean, there's a lot of money that DACD already has to help limited income housing. This is not, you know, this would be helping to coordinate all of that existing funding. This is Correct. for them to be able to ramp up and have that coordination um, project management um, that's that's called out here in and, and things like the navigator that are called out in the bullets below. Um, yes, please. Do I talk at uh, that, that microphone okay. is a live microphone? Um, one could argue I'm jealous because um, <laughs> I was just given 500 million. <laughs> 500, um, but is that money that's just coordination fees or is that like to create a whole new grant program? I just feel like we might want to make those numbers a little closer so that there's consistency. Yeah, I was going to suggest we reduce this one as well. <laughs> You can chat about that if you want, but this is the same issue. Yeah, funding just throwing in these huge numbers without any way of funding it, knowing that we there's no funding available right now. Would it be helpful for us to go to the funding piece, which is at the end of this document? I think that makes sense. <laughs> that, um, All right, uh, Joshua Galloway put his hand up though before we go ahead, Joshua. Hello, Joshua Galloway, task force member. I just wanted to acknowledge that um, DHCD put together this number based on what they see as a need. And so it's a little different context um, from what we just talked about. And we're kind of guessing about what is um, required. And so I like the idea of going to look at the funding. Um, and I just like to raise a, a hand in support of the, the number from DHCD. That's fair. That's a fair comment. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Um, and I, um, for context on the hub funding, the Washington DC hub is currently funded at $850,000 per year, and it does not include single family. So this is a, a, would be a broader scope and a smaller budget than Washington DC has for the, for the hub. Um, so let's talk about funding. Um, and I think you're going to lead this part of the conversation. Yeah, I will. Um, I saw a hand up from another task force member. Okay, though. thank you. Um, Luke, actually, maybe you put your hand back down. Did you want to make a quick comment? Uh, my comment was on the uh, limited income funding. So we can, we'll, we'll start at the the funding, the broader funding conversation. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So looking at um, uh, the last recommendation that we added, you might recall that in our last meeting, um, I talked quickly about some co high level conversation that the Climate Commission had around different funding sources and a little bit of context of what the Climate Pathway Report for Maryland uh, was indicating as, as an essential policy and, and funding mechanism for the state to achieve its goals. And at the re request of the co-chairs, the staff then crafted a recommendation. So uh, this is a new one on your list, state funding for building sector transition. 
The state should implement new revenue generating measures to provide additional state support for improving energy efficiency and reducing GHG emissions from the building sector. The state should investigate an, a, uh, an economy wide cap and invest program, which the, the climate pathway report shows to be a critical policy for achieving the state's GHG emission reduction requirements. And then it continues a little bit more. Other policies that require fossil fuel companies to pay for the pollution produced by their business should be explored. Strong consideration should, all, should be given to fee bait programs that put a fee on specific emission producing activities to fund rebates for zero emission alternatives. An example would be increasing registration fees for fuel burning vehicles to fund incentives for zero emission of vehicles and associated charging infrastructure. So very high level, very, uh, you know, general call for uh, high level policies that would uh, provide additional support for uh, building sector decarbonization, let alone decarbonization in other sectors as well. I'll start the conversation. I think um, that's important that we consider it and think about that because the reality is, um, from what I'm reading and what I know, just looking at modeling, it looks like <clears throat> for what we're what we're trying to do here is is really going to cost Maryland about uh, one billion dollars per year, and that's for everything. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, one point four is it? Is it one point four billion? One point four billion dollars. The 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 to total total investment projected to be needed for the transition is multiple billions of dollars, probably more on the order of three billion. But for what we're talking about in this task force, how much is it? If we were looking at uh, some of the numbers that LBNL has shared with us for the BEPS uh, buildings, is total cap and investment of a billion dollars for compliance activities. Uh, you know, open question about how much should the state's support be included in, in, toward toward the uh, the investment there. When we look at low income, uh, low and moderate income home electrification, uh, and actually middle income as well, um, the number of, I think it was about four hundred million dollars a year would be the public funding for providing electrification incentives for low, moderate, and middle income households. So, I mean, we're we're talking some significant uh, yeah. state support because now we're over one billion. We're at about one point. For like you said, one point five six billion dollars just for what we're talking about in this task force, and we're adding more on here. So this is going to add up to even more money. So again, I think giving a recommendation, a hard one of this is what we need to do, is going to give us credibility and everything that we're asking for because we're giving the, we're, we're putting a solution in here as well. Um, so with with cap and cap and invest alone, uh, we could talk about the other ones. We're projected uh, that we could get like one billion dollars per year uh, with that alone, and that's without taxing taxpayers, without dipping into general funds, which we don't have as a state. We don't have any money, so that's why I'm saying we need to put forward something really strong. So. I just wanted to make that case. I don't know, Co Chair, if you you good. I, um, I'd even suggest that we lead with this. I, I think you, if you lead with what the solutions are, and then you can talk about yeah. all the things you're trying to support. It makes more sense to me because yeah, I'm a bottom line kind of person. <laughs> so, if, if, is there anybody that wants to argue against moving this to become the first of the priority recommendations? Then it will make it easier for us to vote and agree on all this other stuff with all the money because we have a solution and we won't be so, you know, so hard on, well, that's way too much. Let's just take it down to zero because we have an option in here where we can get the money from. Uh, I'm not looking at this is a time if anybody. We, do we have some hands up? Yeah. Members online. Go ahead. Um, go ahead. Call on people, Mark. Uh, first is Jared. From PSC? Proxy for PSC. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, so, hey, everyone. Um, can you hear me all right? We can hear you. Thank you. 
Okay, great. Um, yeah, Jared Delucci, I work here on the uh, advisor staff at the TSC. I'm uh, proxying for Chair Hoover today because he is also in the Empower hearing. Um, we just discussed earlier uh, all these recommendations, and uh, for the fee-based uh, recommendation here, uh, the um, Maybe now we can uh, an exemption for this fee for. You you broke up just for a second there. Can uh, if you go back to fee based program, what, what were you saying about that? Yeah, sure. I, I yeah, sorry, I'm having some bad connection. I think I'm just going to call on my phone real quick. So you can move to the next person, then I'll I'll jump back in. Okay, thank you. We'll do that. Okay. Uh, Tom Ballantyne. Go ahead. So I'm wondering if if I'm not sure whether it's a a question for Mark or someone else, but can you explain how? Uh, in the context of building owners and occupants, um, how cap and invest fits into the alternative compliance fees for BEPS and the Reggie credit system. Yeah, each, each of those would be separate compliance mechanisms. So under cap and invest, so Maryland, currently participates in the cap and invest program called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative that puts requirements on power plants to keep their emissions under certain levels, under a cap, if you will, that declines over time. The idea of a broader cap and invest, as the University of Maryland reported in the Pathway Report, is to include additional sectors under a cap. So one uh, uh, obvious sort of inclusion is the oil and gas sector. So that would be you know, all of the fuels uh, su supplying heating for buildings and for uh, motor transportation fuels. So by including additional sectors under the cap, uh, you have those companies responsible for uh, the compliance obligation to keep emissions below those cap levels. They do so by, jet by having to purchase uh, emissions allowances. So that's the revenue part to the state. The sale of those uh, allowances generates revenue. Again, you know, the CIF uh, funds and, and all of the programs that MEA supports is, a, is an example of how the state is currently using its revenue through the Regity program to invest in clean energy projects around the state. But the, the Pathways report noted the cap and invest as one of the factors that would induce early closure of the gas fired power plants in state so that would that would be stacked on top of other reggie credits it would seem and the fee base bullet looks like a clean heat standard that would apply to delivered fuels maybe to natural gas so the the effect of Growing of, of adding additional sectors under the cap uh, should not have that effect on power plants because power plants are already obligated to comply with the Reggie cap. So the the Reggie would still exist under this uh, uh, proposal uh, and have the same compliance obligations they currently have under Reggie. That's not the narrative I read in the in the Pathways report. I seems like we're getting into a. a back and forth a little bit. So um, I'll let someone else, their other hands up. So I, I appreciate the answer. I'm, and I'll come back to my question if I need to, thanks. Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, Sonia. Uh, Sonia, you're still muted. Can you hear me? Yep. All right. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, Sonia Harbaugh, proxy for Mark Case from BGE. I guess I wanted to ask a clarifying question, too, um, and, and maybe it's sort of implied in your answer, Mark. But when we say in the fee-based section, we pay for the pollution produced by their business, do you think that needs any clarity in terms of the scopes of the emissions that we're talking about so that we don't end up... Um, you know, arguing with one another over whose pollution is responsible for which aspect of the compliance? Uh, sure, yeah, we welcome wordsmithing amendments here. And, and I guess, is it intended 
primarily for generation uh, produced. I guess this piece doesn't say that, like scope one, direct emissions from generated fossil fuel generation, or more broadly to some of the sectors that you were describing. Yeah, I mean, th this is this is ret written to be so so general. I mean, the you know the the, the fee bait concept isn't really meant to be assigned to any particular sector or, or emission source. I mean, in application, of course, it, it would be, but um, but uh, you know, this is more m written written to be much more general in terms of the idea of associating a, a fee on emissions and using fee revenue to fund the thing that moves faster away from that emissions. That emission source. Got it. Um, well, we might consider saying uh, direct pollution or scope one pollution. At least there are you know re requirements already for reporting on that. A kind of agreed upon tracking. As the EPA thinks about how we might expand reporting requirements, that would cover that. Um, but I mean, just a suggestion open to what what the task force thinks mm -hmm. would be helpful. Yep. So maybe specific. Uh, let's see, fee bay programs that put a fee on specific direct emissions producing activities. It's uh, window washers. I think. Uh, okay. If anyone's hearing thumping in the background, we are uh, finally having our windows washed here. So good, good timing for us. Um, all right. Do you want me to try? The editing in real time, I'll put in the word direct in this draft. Uh, sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, and it looks like Jared may be ready um, to speak again. Jared, are you back with us? Uh, uh, not hearing you if you're trying to talk to us right now. Okay. Oh, there you go. There you go. Sorry. <laughs> now we hear you. Okay, great. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, some bad connection. But uh, yeah, again, uh, Jared DeLuce at the Public Service Commission proxy for Chair Hoover. I uh, just wanted to comment on the fee based recommendation uh, per some conversations with uh, the chair earlier. Um, the commission would prefer for there to be an exemption under this recommendation for gas utilities since the cost of these fees would likely be passed on to ratepayers. Um, and just noting that the commission would not really be able to do anything about these costs being passed down because these would be a legitimate cost of service. Um, if it's decided that um, utility should still you know, be under this, this fee, um, it should be made explicit that these costs will be passed down to ratepayers and potentially impact uh, LMI ratepayers uh, for the worse. Um, so uh, the commission just wanted to you know, inform you all of that and uh, just, uh, you know, as a recommendation. So, thank you. I'll let you take those. Yeah, Jared, I, I've got a question. I mean, I've been racking my brain trying to figure out ways to minimize or avoid all of the additional cost being pushed down to the consumers. Um, and I haven't come up with any great answers. Uh, so, Passively, I just assumed all of it would be pushed down to the consumers. Now, do you, do you have any suggestion as to how the regulated community could have to, I don't want to say shoulder disproportionate, but some degree of the increased cost, whether it reduces their profit margin or whatever? I, I'm this has been an issue I've been thinking about for a while. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, to be honest, um, and you know, I know it's definitely was also helpful to come with you know uh, alternative solutions. To be honest, uh, this was a pretty uh, quick discussion this morning amongst the the commission, and I, I probably want to come back to you on that one. Just talking to some of my colleagues. Um, so we've also been thinking, you know, pretty hard about that, and uh, you know, want to be a part of the solution, but. Um, I think right now uh, we don't necessarily have uh, a specific recommendation, but again, we can get back to you on that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. There was, 
uh, I was just going to say there's an additional component to this recommendation that I uh, just forgot to mention in my first read through, uh, which is MDE. This is a recommendation that came in from uh, MCEC. MDE should reinvest all funds raised through the BEPS alternative compliance payments in a specific fund to reinvest the money in building energy transitions, such as the Climate Catalytic Capital Fund or Strategic Energy Investment Fund. Um, that it just, if you're not aware, although I think that we talked about it in the course of this task force, the um, the BEP, BEPS uh, law requires uh, alternative compliance payments uh, to begin at the time of the first compliance period, which uh, is actually technically 2031. So this is this is a potential revenue stream that would begin in 2031 and beyond. Uh, Tom Ballantyne. Thanks, Mark. I, th I think um, we'd prefer to see the BEPS alternative compliance payment funding stream go back into BEPS buildings. There are other funding sources for for the the low and moderate income housing section and for CEF. Um. Okay. Well, and I guess uh, my my read on the MCEC recommendation is that the money would go back to the covered buildings, but through grant and loan programs, either through MCEC, i.e., the C three fund, or through MEA through CEF. So, are you are you saying a more direct pathway that doesn't look like a state supported grant and loan program? But both of those funds, the the C3 and CEF um, do things that are unrelated to to the buildings that are regulated, covered buildings under BEPS, right? No, I don't. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I agree with that, Tom. I mean, part of our mission is to decarbonize. And um, uh, we actually do give grants and rebates to the private sector. Now, my, my understanding, hold on, Tom, for a minute that this won't come to fruition for a number of years. We have to set the baseline in 25, as I recall, and then uh, enforced by 2030. So this won't be the 2031. So I, I'm also not sure there's a, a BEPS building fund that's been not created yet. So I'm not sure if we have to resolve this today, to be honest with you. Uh, we do have a little time. So anyway, and again, I. Whether it comes to CEF, which our agency oversees, obviously I don't want to say no to some additional money, but I'm not sure what the right path is at this point. So I think it's an open question, Tom. Okay, I, just to be clear, I, I wasn't suggesting that those funds don't serve to benefit BEPS-related buildings, but they do lots of things that are outside of the the uh, covered buildings realm, right? Yeah, and I guess the idea here would be that it would be directed to uh, the the BEPS covered buildings through those two state funded programs, state supported programs for investment. Um, so that uh, that could probably be clarifying. Yeah, yeah. If we could, I, Tom, I think the second line, reinvest the money in building energy transition, which is your point. You know, the last part of the sentence we could say, for example just to make it a little bit more ambiguous and, and uh, less forceful in terms of those two organizations. I mean, I think it's an open question. You're suggesting uh, that we add at the end of this bullet here a for example? No, I, I, okay. I think Tom was concerned uh, naming those two, mm -hmm. a minimum okay. reduce the emphasis on reinvesting money in building energy transition. So do I have it, that right, Tom? It's right. It's possible it could go to all kinds of other things that are kind of unrelated to BEPS and the and the the covered buildings under BEPS. But look, the this minor clarification I think is um, much less important than my concerns about the the fees in the first three bullets overlapping, how they interrelate, and what kind of impacts cost impacts that'll have on building owners and and occupants. It's a it's it's a it's a big item to add 
at this stage of the game. So, and we'll give it some consideration, but. Uh, I'm Director Pinsky, uh, can, uh, can we make it so that people can see the text on the screen here? Um, were you suggesting that we take out such as and replace it with, for example, in the, in the third bullet yeah. under, or fourth bullet? And I'm not even against or a new entity. I, I, I think, look, I think it's less ambiguous than, than Tom does because it says it's got to be reinvested in building energy transitions. Mm -hmm. So I think the fear that C for C3 is going to use it for another purpose is a little unfounded. But if we want to allay those fears in some way, shape, or form, I'm fine with it. Or new funds? Would, uh, so, in other words, we would say, for example, yeah. the climate catalytic C3 funds, the C or a new funds? Is that? Sure. Okay. Uh, in a new specific fund? Yeah. Again, I, I think Thomas said this is not the primary area of conflict. Right. So right. I don't want to get in the weeds and spend too much time on it, yep. to be honest. Okay. Do you want to call the question on the recommendation as it is or continue uh, discussion on it? Do you want to call for a vote on this? For this whole section or? Potentially for the whole section, uh, unless we have more comments we haven't got, we've had some concerns expressed, but not so much. Can you change the word should to must? Reinvest? Um, NDE should. shall, shall reinvest. Oh, okay. Sure. Definitive. Okay. So the, the question would be, as modified, this, um, these four bullets under state funding for building Sector transition. Which one of you so over? All right, um, Director Pinsky has moved that we go to a vote uh, on this new section. So the, the this is a, a vote only for task force members, um, and if we could ask the task force members um, in the room, raise your hand, and we're going to raise hands um, online as well. Is that how we're going to do it? So the, the the first is that we'll ask for a vote to approve this new section. And then after next, we'll ask for a vote to in opposition. So all who vote to approve this new section, please raise your hand. Okay. Um, is somebody taking, Cindy, are you taking, can you take down all the votes? Yes. I count. Cindy, I had 11 yes. Did, was that right? Five in the room and. Five. Yeah, 11 yes. Okay. Uh, all task force members who are opposed, everyone please lower your hand now. All task force members who are opposed, please raise your hand. Three opposed. Three opposed. No, no opposition in the room. Uh, any abstentions? Any task force members who are abstaining, please raise your hand. Everyone lower your hand now. And then any task force members who are abstaining, please raise your hand. Luke, um, you still have your hand up. Are you abstaining or are you opposed? Okay. So if one abstention. Okay. All right. The vote carries. So with that, we will go back to the top of the documents. We were talking about the one-stop shop. Okay. Um, all right. So um, we were talking about the budget for the one-stop shop. Uh, in view of the fact that we've approved the funding, are you comfortable <laughs> with the price tag for the one-stop shop? If, if only it were that am. easy. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, so um, it, I have not heard any uh, opposition to the one-stop shop with this budget, this 3.5 to 4.2, to now that Secretary McElwain is um, reflecting the, the funding budget, the funding vote. Um, so unless anybody has any comments, we'll move on to the next item. 
Not only that, MEA might put a budget amendment in asking for some of that money later on. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to revisit the budget for the hub? No. I was just going to okay. This. All right. Uh, yes, please. Josh Galloway. Yes. Hello, Joshua Galloway, task force member. Um, I would like to go back to the, the first conversation and follow up on Becky's comment. Um, now that we have some funding, I think it makes sense to go back and discuss just a little bit how much money we're talking here and base it on what the, the DC um, group is doing. And so I don't think it has to be $10 million, but um, open it back up to Becky to finish her thought. I didn't really have a thought. I was just kind of raising. <laughs> the, I just wanted there to be some consistency in case the second floor asked. I was also just being facetious. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were for fall. <laughs> had a point. Uh, yeah, in other words, if we're saying eight times as much to focus on low income housing and 500 to focus on everything. Yeah. I don't want to get us distracted. I mean, a lot of this money will go to the buildings, to figuring out how they're going to make the transition. Obviously, having governmental process to see it through is important. Um, should they be more aligned? Probably. Um, but again, Tom and I don't always agree. Uh, we we rarely agree. But a lot of the money is to help the transition. It's it's not the professional advice from the agency. So we say it can ramp up in the out years. I think there's some other questions we haven't. Maybe we're not. I don't know if there there are some more sections of tax incentives. So I, I guess while I don't disagree that they're a little bit out of balance, I I think it is a little bit of a conceptual distraction and i guess i'd like to move on with the other uh, issues i mean look we don't know exactly how much is going to have to be invested in buildings i mean we don't know how much of the cap and invest will be that will have to be approved by either governor or legislature or both so there are a lot of unanswered questions and i i i think for us to focus on secondary or tertiary issues at this point, when there are a few big ones in front of us, uh, it doesn't do us uh, well. So while I conceptually have some concerns, I think we should move on to the other recommendations. Okay, uh, Joshua, um, uh, I think we're gonna move on unless you wanna push the point. Nope, I think I'm fine, thank you. All right, so the next one is, uh, and uh, here we got a sort of a last minute, uh, we've discussed before, the next one is uh, provide Medicaid funding for building improvements. We've discussed this before, the, the text in black is what had previously been agreed, but we also previously alerted folks that the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative was going to be providing um, uh, additional text on this. And now, uh, yesterday we got the additional text um, and it's reflected here in red below. Um, and rather than reading it, uh, I, I, I would just alert people that um, the, actually it's so new that the printout is a little, doesn't reflect this. So I'm gonna hold it uh, on the screen um, for folks to read and I apologize that the, the page break isn't ideal here. I'm gonna give us a new page break. Um, In binoculars. Just read it. Yeah, okay, I will read it aloud if people want to hear it. <laughs> the Maryland Department of Health and uh, Maryland Medicaid Administration should look at the potential issuance of a policy statement based on known evidence that removing fossil fuel appliances in a home is a potential health and social determinants of health measure to lower uh, exposures to carbon emissions and benzene that, is shown, that have been shown, I'll put a bin in there, uh, to damage respiratory and neurological health. Uh, the Departments of Housing and Community Development and the Maryland Department of Health should explore uh, expanding use of unused Maryland Ch Children's Health Insurance Program administration dollars 
Healthy Homes for Healthy Kids program to allow for fuel switching, replacement of fossil fuel appliances, including gas stoves, and upgrading whole house electrical systems. And then the third bullet is a means to create more holistically healthy homes. MDH and or uh, DHCD should fund a study of residential decarbonization electrification measures with the goal of quantifying their SDOH impacts, including hospitalizations and emergency department visits for asthma and respiratory diseases. MDH or DHCD should seek philanthropic and federal funds for example, HUD's Healthy Homes technical study to defray the costs of the study. That is the, the new recommended text. Um, and uh, is there anyone from G uh, Ruth Ann or anybody else from GHHI that wants to add color on that? They're not here. Okay. Is there a precedent to this in any other state? Um, in some cases, I think this is, uh, there's been a lot of talk about this, but I think that in some cases, this has not yet been done elsewhere. Um, but it has been, it is an area, an, uh, an area that's been uh, socialized, I know, for quite some time. And uh, I know Ruth Ann believes that Maryland is uniquely well positioned to be a trailblazer, uh, that the Secretary of Health has uh, been an innovator in this area. Is there anybody that objects to adding this new text? And I, and I also say that Ruth Ann said that this is unspent funds. Uh, this money is going back to the federal government because it hasn't been, that Maryland hasn't been spending its full potential allotment. I think, I think it's fine to keep it. We didn't hear anything. We're going to vote on it anyway. We'll be voting on the final report yeah. uh, on the 28th. Okay. Uh, I don't hear any objections, so I assume it's acceptable. Um, moving on to the next section, financing building energy transitions. So again, the black text is text we previously agreed, and, and the red text is uh, new text. So um, Baltimore Gas and Electric, BG&E, had suggested uh, it, we previously had investigate options for ratepayers uh, with on-bill repayment options to finance efficiency and electrification projects, BG&E had suggested adding and off-bill repayments. Um, uh, now, I, I think we have a BG&E rep on the call. I know Mark Case is at the Empower here, hearing, but um, can the BG&E rep explain what off-bill repayment options means? Yeah, absolutely. This is Sonia Harbaugh. Um, really, what we're what we're meaning is instead of being uh, so it cannot be misconstrued with on bill financing such that um, the utility bill and the utility itself becomes subject to essentially functioning like a bank with consumer protections and all those type of things we're not really prepared to do that um, however off bill financing and using the utility bill as a vehicle to administer the bill, I, I think is okay. I, I think, you know, a, a comparable model is how we administer bills for community solar um, sub subscriber entities. We have a hand. Go ahead, please. Hey, this is Mark Shebus from Office of People's Council. I'm, I, I, um, I'm struggling with I mean, it sounded to me that what you just described as off-bill financing is is on the bill, that there literally will be a line item on the bill. And so I, I don't, you know, when I what I thought this meant with off-bill off financing is financing that doesn't have to do with the utility bill at all. And I guess that's, I'm struggling with this whole bullet because given the elimination of the inve inclusive utility investment section that we cut last week, I'm not really sure what this means right now. And I guess my specific question is, what is the argument for making this solely about utility ratepayers? Um, if we're talking about on-bill and off-bill repayment options and expanding financing generally, I wonder if we should make it to provide Marylanders, not just Marylanders in their capacity as utility ratepayers, with more options to uh, finance efficiency and electrification projects. The other sort of wordsmithing concern I have is that the word repayment um, begs the question of what is being repaid. 
And I think that adds to the sort of vagueness and ambiguity of, of this bullet as it's currently constructed. And, and I think we had actually, BGE had provided um, a suggestion before that yeah, we, we, we agree that this shouldn't be utility financing. Um, so I, I believe, uh, and I apologize I wasn't on the last uh, round of this, but I believe utility was taken out and it was meant uh, that it would not be, you know, a loan against the customer's meter or, or something of that nature so that it couldn't be confused as some sort of loan or quasi loan structure. So maybe. There had previously been three types of uh, on bill repayment that had been considered inclusive utility investment, which the task force uh, voted to not include. Um, uh, at BGE's request, the idea of on bill financing, where the utility is actually providing the financing, was also taken out. Uh, but there was third party repayment was the one that had no objection. So I think we're not specifically referencing it, but that's what I think uh, has consensus with the task force is third party repayment on bill repayment. So the, it, the bill, the, the line item appears on your utility bill, but the fund, the capital is not coming from the utility. It's coming from a third party. Um, and, so that's, and, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, and I think if, if the utility bill is one of other vehicles that could be used to um, administer a, a green bank repayment or some other outside finance. I think we're opening open to that. I don't think the utilities that is our preference. Um, so I think that was the idea of off bill that it's we're not exclusively looking for the utility bill to be the vehicle. I think if we're talking about third party financing, that's what we should say. Otherwise, I don't understand why we're talking about rate payers at all as opposed to Marylanders generally. I mean, this could be constructed in a much more general way. Investigate options to provide Marylanders with new options to finance efficiency and electrification projects, comma, including through on-bill utility and off-bill options, something like that. But as, as it is right now, it is, I think, unhelpfully ambiguous. Um, uh Sonia, is that uh, approximately the, the language that we just heard? Would that be acceptable to you? Uh, yeah, I think so. All right, let me, I don't see any objections, so let me try to capture that. Go ahead, Mark, and re investigate options to provide Marylanders. Yeah, with, with new options to finance efficiency and electrification projects, comma, including through including both on bill and off bill options. And, and I think for us, we still were trying to make a, uh, a distinction between repayment where we're acting more as a, a collector, but we're not actually involved in the loan um, and serving as the bank. Um, yes, uh, hold on a second. Let me get, get Mark's recommendation first and then we can edit that once we have it. So including, I'm sorry, Mark, I was cutting and pasting. Yeah. And I, Including what exactly? I think, I mean, I think you could just cut the word rate payers there. Okay, including then, on bill and off bill repayment options. Yeah, I think that works. Yeah, I think uh, that's can, simple. For additional clarity, maybe we should say on utility bill. Is that all right? I, I don't think we're trying to say it is exclusive to utility bills. I think that's the point of trying to broaden it to Marylanders. No, I mean, we have off bill would be not, but on utility bill and off bill repayments. Is that good? Or I mean, if you want to stick with just on bill without any specification, but at, at this point, there's no reference to utilities whatsoever. So off bill is kind of cryptic or on bill mm -hmm. is kind of cryptic as well. Right. Is on utility bill acceptable? Maybe on bill, uh, on utility bill repayment and off bill repayment or financing. So does, does okay. BGE want the reference to third party capital providers? Uh, maybe that would add some, some clarity to this. Um, the third party would be doing the financing aspect. On bill utility. repayment to third party capital providers and off bill repayment, is that good? I think that could work. Yeah, I mean, I. I think that works. I, I don't, I'm still not sure I understand what the value of the phrase and off bill is there, but I don't know that it's, it's problematic with, with, the, with the context changed.
Okay. All right. Sounds like we have consensus on this language. Um, hearing no objection, I'm going to move on to the next bullet. This is a bullet that was suggested by MCEC um, in their comments, and I'll read it. Expands the capital and funding for state and county green banks through expanded funding for the climate catalytic capital C3 funds to enable the state green bank to provide low cost loans for implementation of commercial and residential building energy performance improvements through direct loans or leveraged with federal and private capital. Allow funds to be used for loss guarantees, rate subsidies, and other forms of credit enhancements or grants as deemed appropriate by the C3 Fund Investments uh, Oversight Committee. I invite any objections. Otherwise, we'll move on. Cliff? Yes, please. Yeah, I don't know if uh, Kathy or someone from MCC or from Montgomery County uh, Green Bank, I'm a little confused by the first two lines. We're talking about funding for state and county green banks to expand funding for C3. I don't know if C3 is investing in like the Montgomery County Green Bank. I, I, Perhaps we should add the word including, so including through expand uh, I, I don't investment know funding. What the purpose is, or uh, is anybody here from either of those two entities? Do we have anyone from NCEC or Montgomery County Green Bank on the line? Yes, please go ahead. Hi, everybody. Amy Gillespie from Maryland Clean Energy Center. Kathy is in Vermont, and I don't have clarity on what she meant specifically for that, but I can get it from her and, and get back to you guys. Are we okay with putting a pin in this? It seems like broadly there's agreement, but we want a wordsmith, so we'll have um, MCEC clarify, and we'll work with MEA offline. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, the next two bullets are black. They've already been agreed to. An additional recommendation from EC on access. Since uh, CPACE, Commercial Property Assessed Clean Energy Financing, is available through MD PACE program in the, to the majority of Maryland counties, and no cost program administration is available through MCEC, the state should encourage all counties to enact ordinances to allow private owners across the state to access, access to CPACE financing. Any objections? All right, moving on. New section, it's a brand new section, uh, leverage private capital. Um, and this is, uh, again, reflective of, of some comments that were received. Um, the, I'll read the text. The state and local jurisdictions should pursue avenues to leverage private capital to augment resources available from existing programs and support building decarbonization priorities, including colon, two bullets. <laughs> Work with private capital sources to develop mechanisms for providing private capital directly to public and private building owners. Work with private, private capital sources to ensure that programs they develop meet state standards so that building owners can be confident that taking advantage of these programs will not run into regulatory issues. Um, if uh, the person who authored this um, wants to add any additional um, color, feel free. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, Tom. I didn't author this. I was wondering if someone could clarify where the private, what private capital was contemplated here. Were... I think this would be like um, banks and private equity and other capital sources that are interested in lending money to building owners to enable them to improve the performance of their building, comply with BEPS and, and other things along those lines. Um, I think that this is a private capital provider that submitted this comment, and I, I invite anyone who knows offhand who, who submitted it to, to raise your hand. Um, what, what are we here? Do you know who it was, Cindy? Yes. Who was it? Dunn Scott. Okay, Dunn Scott suggested this. Why do we have to make that clear in here? I mean, uh, I don't, the, the, the final report won't make that clear. I was just, if no, anybody wants No, no, okay. I mean, leverage private capital. I, I was mean, gonna say CPACE is, is a, like CPACE on the, in the financing building energy trend, like the above topic is a form of private capital. So could it not just be looped in? 
I think that Dunn is concerned that there there ha is some uncertainty um, by certain folks um, that make them hesitate to do seed pace. Uh, and that's the second, the last bullet, I think, is um, trying to provide a level of certainty so that people will not hesitate to borrow, take on seed pace borrowing. Seed pace also doesn't apply to all different type of building types. So this could apply to a broader okay. scope. Okay, I don't, I mean, I, I don't see any harm in this one. Just okay. Uh, I, more money. Raise your hand if you have an objection. Otherwise, we're going to move on. Uh, there's a hand up. For, I, for yeah, I, I have a question. I, I, yeah, I, I, I would. I think this is another one that we should put a pin in until Dunn can be on the call because I don't quite understand again what this means. It sounds to me, I mean, with the word leverage, leverage means that the state is putting in something to to you know create the input from the capital provider. Um, and I, I guess I, I want to understand better what it is that the state is providing. It sounds to me generally that this is a proposal for state and local jurisdictions to de-risk private capital in some way. And there may be an argument for that. I don't want to foreclose that. But I think um, I, I'm, yeah, I just don't quite, I want to understand what a mechanism would be um, in the first bullet and also what kind of programs we're talking about in the second bullet, because usually... I mean, I, yeah, what, what, why is the, what kind of program is the private capital source offering? And private capital sources offer capital, usually not programs. So I think, I, I just don't quite understand this. I, I, I call your attention to the first bullet there, the very first bullet, the parent bullet. Uh, he's talking about resources from existing programs. So I think there's been some concerns potentially that uh, you couldn't stack capital from existing programs with capital from CPACE borrowing to fund the same building, the same project. I think, and I wish he was here to speak for himself, but I think that's part of um, what this recommendation is speaking to. Uh, and then, of course, it references public buildings there. There's things like energy savings performance contracts where public buildings take advantage of private capital to make improvements and it gets repaid through energy savings. Um, so that's one of several mechanisms that I think are being referenced in, in the sort of broad high level bullets. Right, because I'm not sure as as written that that's limited to CPACE because you were kind of implying that this was just CPACE. It's written, it's- Yeah, that's right. There's no reference to CPACE in this section. This is, this is broader than CPACE. I'm still not understanding the difference between the above section, financing building energy transitions and this one. Can't this just be looped, like, bucketed into that? Uh, yeah, potentially we, could, potentially we could um, combine m these two sections. Because leveraging private capital is a way of financing. Yep, we could make leverage private capital a <laughs> sub-bullet to financing building energy transitions. Does that anybody object to that? That makes um, sense. Yeah, reordering. Okay. Uh, and we'll ask Dunn at the next meeting, assuming he comes to um, provide a little bit more color on this. But it sounds like people have some questions, but nobody's really objecting to this right now. Is that accurate? Yeah. Okay, we're going to move on. Um, end investment in fossil fuel equipment and infrastructure. Um, and now this is something that the task force has agreed to and the um, subgroups have recommended, but I think that this represents some new text um, to capture some comments that we got. Um, do folks want me to actually read? It's a bit long, I can read it if that's helpful or we have it on screen and you have it on your printouts. At this point we've got. Give right. people a minute to look it over. Just, I'll, I'll, uh, as Director Pinky suggests, I'll give you all two minutes to read this. While they're reading, uh, where's the original text? That's a good question. <laughs> I, I believe this is read not because it's new, but because it wasn't discussed oh. on October 26th. Oh, okay, that's right. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. remember, we, we didn't get to the end of the document. Oh, on, okay, on, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Louise. That yep. was uh, Louise Shero from IMT staff who's taking notes on this meeting and mm -hmm. behind the scenes, she's making everything happen. <laughs> okay, so that's all new. Okay. Got 
Yeah, so this is text that was came out of the subgroups and was recommended by subgroups, but it has not yet been considered by the full task force. Perhaps it was previously defined, but if we could spell out the stride. That's a good suggestion. Stride, we reference the stride program, and I think it's better to define it in there since it's at least first time I noticed it reference. Cindy, would you mind looking up stride and writing it out there? I wonder if we can ask BGE if it's anything specifically or if it's just called stride. I think it, yeah, it's like strategic. Oh, I found it. Something yeah. each other. Thank you, yeah. Marsh. I can help out if you didn't find it yet. We've, uh, uh, there's a hand up from Luke. Found it. Yes, thank you. If we're if we're drawing to the end of the reading period, then uh, Luke, do you want to go ahead with your comment? Um, sure. It, it just kind of a question about the uh, the proposed change in incentives. Um, uh, like, would this prohibit like controls for like boiler systems or uh, gas related systems? Um, and like, what is is the parameter specifically for gas equipment, or would it relate to any any system that touches that gas equipment? Because there might be savings that you can get. Um, you know, it would be short of electrification, but it would uh, reduce your gas use if you can kind of modulate um, that gas use accordingly. Um, I, I think the intention was only um, the, the prohibition only applied to gas equipment. So if uh, if it was controls that could be applied to other heating systems, say, then that would not be gas equipment. And, and just to double down on that, because these are recommendations that the state's climate commission has made, I think, two or three years in a row now. And the conversation was always about uh, the incentives for the actual uh, new fuel burning equipment and not so much associated you know, controls that would have emission re reduction impacts on existing equipment. Okay, that that's good to know. Uh, in DC, um, I, I run into issues occasionally um, looking at projects that, you know, uh, would reduce would reduce gas use, but was related to the gas equipment itself. Um, so I, I wanted to make sure that that wouldn't be the same same kind of thing here. Right. Are you uh, comfortable now with with this wording? I, I don't know if I'd say I'm entirely comfortable with it. Um, I'm still a little bit worried about the the you know uh, the challenge of electrification, but um, I, I at least understand kind of what it's it's going for now. Got it. Oh, okay. Uh, I see Sonia has her hand raised. Hi. Yeah. Um, so I, I wanted to just comment that, you know, there's a there's a lot in this one, um, you know, touching on uh, the energy plan and stride and empower incentives. And you know, I, from the BGE perspective, um, we have to oppose this one. Um, we've done a number of studies that show there are multiple pathways to reach that, that to net zero. And to the prior question, some of them do include retaining the gas system as a delivery mechanism. So I think it's really important for folks to remember there's a, a very big difference between the gas itself that we all agree is going to reduce significantly in every possible scenario to reach our state goals and leveraging the, the gas system itself. Um, you know, I'd also ask folks to consider that, you know, that point there around uh, ending the stride program that the purpose of the stride program initially is really you know there's five different criteria but two of them are for safety and reliability and also for reducing greenhouse gas reductions and I just want to remind folks I don't think that they have to be in opposition with one another if you look at what's happening at the at the national level take themsa for example the federal agency that's responsible for gas pipeline safety um, they're actually calling for uh, uh, 
utilities to increase the replacement of cast iron pipes, which are most leak prone. And you know, even though they're only 2% of the US system, they're responsible for 36% of, of fatalities. Um, and on the greenhouse gas side of things, um, we've seen tremendous steps since the STRIDE program began where the risk of future leaks is reduced 80 fold. We've really reduced leaks by about 40% since STRIDE began and commensurately greenhouse gas emissions are reduced. And a problem with this is also, I think, you know, if we, if we wait to fix the pipes until they leak, we're actually sacrificing safety and the climate impact. Um, you know, and I guess lastly, I would just say, um, for, con for context too, we do have some other states, New York, for example, uh, who's right there with us being thought leaders um, and uh, really taking the, the climate crisis seriously. Their commission uh, recently, uh, earlier this year, uh, agreed and ordered Con Ed to complete 240 miles uh, of leak pipe, uh, leak prone pipes, again, citing safety and, and the climate impact. Um, so we've submitted written comments uh, hopefully you've had a chance to see that. We've also submitted uh, a letter um, jointly with the other three utilities that deliver gas. But I would just ask everyone to really think about uh, the 1.2 million existing gas customers who will need time to transition. We are very much in favor of electrification, but that transition has to be safe. It has to re be reliable. Um, and, and we're all working to find ways to make it more affordable. Tony, I guess I'm I'm just curious because what you just said sounds like it supports the recommendation. I mean, the recommendation is to ensure that utilities prioritize the highest risk infrastructure or gas pipes that are leaking and most leak prone, uh, and consider less alternative, less costly alternatives to replacement. I mean that that aligns with the good points you were making about the the benefits of replacing the most leak prone pipes. Yeah, I, I think what I'm what I'm trying to communicate, and apologies if, if I'm not being clear, that that is what the Stride program is currently doing, um, the, and the PSC has has insight and transparency into every single um, job that is replaced. Um, so I, I think the idea to end the Stride program before we have viable alternatives feels premature um, with this with this recommendation as it stands currently. As currently designed. Yeah, I mean, this. I think the recommendation originally came from from OPC. Uh, although Director Pinsky, I don't, I, I don't mean to cut you off. I have to defer to OPC if they'd like to speak first. If not, I'll speak. The recommendation came from the subgroups process, and right. um, there were modifications made due to comments received from OPC and Earth Justice. Earth Justice is not here today. Yeah, and, and Mark, I'm here from OPC, so I'm happy to speak to this a little bit. Um, First, I think it's important to clarify that this is about stride, a particular statute, not about the gas system as a whole. Utilities have an obligation under the public utilities article to provide safe and reliable service with or without stride. So changing or even removing the stride statute does not affect at all the utility obligation to provide safe and reliable gas service as long as we have a gas system. That's point number one. Second point is that stride was enacted in 2013. The world was a very different place 10 years ago. It was very soon after the advent of fracking, gas was perceived more as a climate solution than as a climate problem, in part because at that time, coal was the largest source of power generation in the US. The world has changed drastically since. Maryland has much more aggressive climate goals than it did 10 years ago. And I think third point is it's important to remember what stride is for. The purpose of STRIDE is to incentivize gas utilities to replace gas infrastructure. Now, anytime you're replacing an old pipe with a new pipe, almost invariably, or yeah, invariably, it's gonna lead to fewer leaks and more safety and reliability. But the point is that as it's currently written, and I think this is the point of the recommendation, the statute does not require utilities to prioritize those parts of their system that are leaking the most, that are most vulnerable to accidents and leaks. And so I think there's a, there's a really strong argument for updating the statute in light of what Maryland's climate goals are and what we know the, the shortcomings of the statute are. You know, we have a lot 
of technologies now that didn't exist or at least were not commercially viable 10 years ago that enable utilities to understand where the most leak prone parts of their system are. And this, this proposed change is about changing the stride structure to ensure that utilities are prioritizing the parts of their system that need to be replaced most and repairing parts that don't. I think the, the big picture is, is that, you know, I mean, there, there's an argument about how long we'll need a gas system and in what form we'll need it. And BGE has its perspective and OPCs has its perspective and you'll see the materials that we submit. Um, but, but to engage in wholesale replacements of the kind that we're doing right now, spending potentially billions of dollars for a system that we may not need so that those uh, result in stranded costs, that is hugely problematic. And if we're talking about the need to fund clean energy investments, one massive resource is avoided costs, avoided investments in the gas system that otherwise we're all paying for. So OPC uh, strongly supports this recommendation. It, it, I think it could go much further, but I think this is a, a, a pretty, pretty actually conservative approach to, to this issue. Okay, I, I'm, I'm not hearing any wordsmithing amendments, but uh, uh, thank you, Sonia, for stating um, uh, BG's vote on this matter. Are there any further discussion before you want to? Well, I'm, I'm happy to uh, elaborate on OPC, or I can just move adoption of this section. As you like. Here, call. Um, are people need convincing or not. Another <laughs> page and a half. Let's move. Okay, yeah, uh, I, I would move adoption of this section um, uh, for our report. Okay, um, so uh, we're going to take a vote on this. Um, and uh, first, we're going to ask. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Take your state your question, please. I just wanted uh, an update on what. The, the, there is a proceeding in front of the Public Service Commission on this subject. Is that right? Yeah. I don't think so. on, there, on there's the, a gas planning docket, but that deadline has passed. If you haven't taken any action in that docket yet, I'm not sure that's explicitly about stride, but more general than that. Empower has ongoing hearings, and right now we have a few members missing because they're attending the Empower hearing, correct? And all the utilities also, all the big gas utilities, BGE, uh, Columbia, and Washington Gas Light all have pending uh, proposals to Washington Gas Light and Columbia are new stride plans and, and BGE rather than filing, Sonia can speak to this, a new stride plan to to replace their plan that ends at, the, at, at, at uh, this calendar year has proposed to move the investments that are currently being made in stride into general rate uh, capital proceedings and there is a case with the commission case 9707 that is about long-term planning for gas uh and the future of the gas system and our position on that was that while we would welcome uh that conversation and to explore that it, it is premature while the state has not yet determined what the role of gas really will look like in the future just kind of putting the cart before the horse. So, Tom, you may be thinking of that. Well, then, then I will speak briefly on this issue. Um, uh, I think this language is right on target, to be honest with you. Um, somebody mentioned when Stride was adopted 10 years ago, I believe it passed by one vote in the Maryland Senate because uh, there was a lot of question debate of long-term investment. Even then, 10 years ago, in an industry that might go by the wayside because of climate and other issues. I think one of the concerns, and OPC mentioned it, replacing all of this pipe for the future and paying for it for the next 20 or 30 years, which will reach the billions of dollars when it might, in fact, not be used as we transition to clean energy seems like a uh, fool's gold, if you will. Um, and I appreciate uh, BG&E and uh, commitment to clean energy, but
but at the same time saying we believe in clean energy, but we need to have a backup gas system is perplexing to me. And I can tell you that the Maryland Climate Commission, either two or three years ago, under the previous administration, mind you, under the previous administration, had a study done. And the study by E3 said that moving towards clean energy and heat pumps can be done without using gas in almost virtual, virtually all uh, scenarios. And they were based on inputs that the Climate Commission thought were fair and reasonable. Now, I'm told that BGE has a newer report based on their inputs that has a different result, which shouldn't come as a shock. So, you know, I, I think if we are moving forward and the governor's called for 100% clean energy, I don't see the future 20 or 30 years from now in natural gas. I mean, it, it emits, you know, greenhouse gases. I mean, that's been proven. I'm not a scientist. I got like a C in science back then, but I, I can read all, all the uh, periodicals and, and, and the books on that. You know, I, when we're talking about billions of dollars, the question I think we have to face is where can that money best be spent? Should it be spent on investing in clean energy, renewable energy, uh, whether it's uh, uh, onshore, offshore wind, or or uh, solar, or um, geothermal, or whatever it might be. And to now, because of replacement, not because of safety, as was said, right now that is an obligation regardless of whether Stride exists or not. And I don't think any of us want to put anybody's life in danger. But to replace just to replace when we'll be paying for it, or the ratepayers will be paying for this for 30 or 40 years, and it will be diverting money that can be used for clean energy, away from clean energy, um, seems to me um, a solution without a rationale that will benefit um, Maryland ratepayers or the planet for that matter. So uh, I strongly think this is the right language. I think it is a, um, a fundamental point of this proposal report uh, that we are moving in a different direction. So I, I will wholeheartedly um, vote for this as I've already moved it forward. Okay, with that, we will take a vote. Um, so first we will ask for people who are voting in support of this language, uh, both in the room and online. Um, Mark, uh, go ahead. Oh, you're you're just raising no, I, was your hand. I was voting. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, thank you. All right. So first, we'll ask uh, for task force members only to vote. Um, if you support this language, uh, raise your hand if you're online or in the room, and we'll count. We have six on online who've raised their hands, and. Five. Five in the room, so that's 11 votes for. Uh, now, everyone, please lower your hand. All right, now uh, those opposed, both in the room and online, only task force members. We have no uh, opposed in the room. We have four opposed online. So 11 to four votes. Any abstentions? Everyone please lower your hands, sorry. Okay, we have one abstention. Uh, okay, so the motion carries. Uh, this language is adopted. It will be black next time we see it. It will be in the final report. All right, moving on to tax incentives. Um, here we have language that's um, mostly the same as before. Previously, it said that the um, comptroller would do this, uh, and the comptroller's suggestion we're generalizing to the state should recommend these tax incentives. Um, uh, the red addition of providing efficiency in paperwork and reporting, that's just a, it's a, an additional modifier on what the task force had previously agreed. 
And then two new bullets uh, in red below, which I will read. Include options such as elective pay for entities such as governments and nonprofits that do not have a tax liability. That's so that these they can take advantage, even those who don't pay taxes can take advantage, and there's precedence in various taxes, including federal taxes. Incentives should be performance-based and not prescriptive or uh, not prescriptive of specific technologies. Incentives should fund investments that are most cost-effective, for example, at the beginning of planning, or are harder to finance, such as energy audits and decarbonization, portfolio planning, electric service upgrades, and building envelope improvements. This language, I think, is a language that came out of the subgroups. It's just, um, a re I think, moved to a different place here. And then the Comptroller's Office should offer fiscal expertise to help evaluate tax incentive ideas, assist with identifying uh, effective criteria for take up of tax incentives, and determine the financial and operational impacts of any proposed or discussed tax incentives. Any objections to this language? Yes, please, go ahead. Hi, uh, this is Luke. Uh, this isn't necessarily an objection. I just wanted to sort of clarify um, so like the the language specifically is not that the task force is recommending that the state do this the tax incentives uh the language is more that like the the state should charge the comptroller's office with doing is that is that just sort of a policy um requirement like the, it's their authority um that we have to like uh, sort of use that particular language um instead of saying that the task force recommends you know uh, the state doing these long-term tax incentives. I just uh, I, well, to be I, clear I think we recommend that, like, the task yeah. force supports this, and not just you know kind of going going back and forth on like oh maybe they should think about it because um, then the comptroller's office might just be like oh well we'll think about it. Uh, that's a good point. So uh, I mean I think that my sense is the task force wants to see these long-term tax incentives, um, but we were not able to come up with specific recommendations. We can clarify it to make it clear that we recommend long-term tax incentives along the lines described here, and then just add at the bottom, you know, the state should um, come up with um, such incentives. Um, the, the, I think we have consensus around these tax incentives. What we don't have is spe a specific proposal on this, this incentive should be X dollars per square foot or per whatever, whatever the, you know, the mechanism. Uh, and so that's, but I think we can send a stronger message along the lines that you described, Luke, to say, look, we recommend this, and now you state figure out the details. Does that address what, what you're trying to say, Luke? Um, yeah, that, that largely addresses it. Should we just change should to shall? Um, I, th the first I think, I, I think the, the state should put in place long-term, and then um, we can add in. I think that maybe if we just say put in place, um, long-term tax incentives, is that acceptable to everybody? Is this a- There's a hand up from Mark S. Go ahead, Mark. I don't have a, a comment on that specific point. I have a comment on one of the bullets, so I don't know if you want to hold that. All right. It doesn't sound like anybody has any concerns. Luke, are you? Do you like this? The state should put in place long-term tax incentives. Is that okay for you? Uh, yeah, that that works for the line. Okay. I got a hand from Tom Ballantyne. Go ahead, Tom. Thanks. Um, so the exceptionally cost-effective time windows are. It's a good practice. Um, but the the real challenge that's going to need the most tax incentive are the situations that aren't cost effective at all. And I, I think it's worth emphasizing that the the capital stack is going to be very difficult for some building types and situations. Do you have a, a specific wording that you would suggest? Well, you could go back to language similar to what was in Senate Bill 528, say with an emphasis on on uh, situations that don't provide a reasonable return on investment. Okay. I'm not recalling the language specifically, but 
All right. I'll take care of this, Cindy. Um, you could put a pin in it. On situations. You could put um, a pin in it for two or three minutes. We can work it out, but yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll put a pin in that and go to Mark. Thanks, Cliff. Could you scroll down to the to the first bullet when you finish with the language you're working on? Um, we're going to go ahead and scroll down, and I think Tom's going to think and come back to us with exact wording. Okay. Um, looking at that first bullet and the sentence beginning, and sentence should, incentives should help fund investments uh, that are most cost effective, e.g. at the beginning of planning, or are harder to finance, such as energy audits and decarbonization portfolio planning, electric service upgrades, and building envelope improvements. Um, those... I don't know they're necessarily contradictory, but you'd think that investments that are more cost effective would be easier to finance. Um, so I, this is confusing me about exactly what kind of projects incentives are being recommended for. And I'm also not sure that it's always true that the things that are described as harder to finance are harder to finance. I mean, I'm sure in some cases they may be, um, but I, I wonder if this language is sort of necessary, if, if, if this bullet could stop at incentives should be performance-based and not prescriptive of specific technologies, or if, if I don't know who, who sort of initially crafted this language, but I'd be interested to hear more about the, the, the sort of direction of this, of this funding that's described here. I think, uh, yes, I think part of this is that sometimes it's hard to get pre-development uh, planning funding. It's easier to finance the actual um, construction, say. Uh, and so that's unfortunate because the time when you can, when money can have the biggest impact is at the very beginning, before you have conceptual design, before you've even selected your design firm. So at the beginning of planning is referencing. Uh, it's hard to, it's most cost effective, but it's also, if, if you don't have programs that are designed for it, it's least likely to get financed. So it's, it's calling attention to the need for financing at the very beginning of the uh, planning process. Uh, and then um, similar, harder to finance. Uh, yeah, it's easy to, you can get like equipment leases and things like that, but you can't get equipment leases obviously for energy audits. Um, so there, I think there is, there is um, everything here makes sense, but I can see how on its face, it does seem to contradict. You kind of have to know a lot about the, financing process to realize that it, that it all makes sense and it doesn't contradict. Could, could we, could it be limited to just incentives should help fund investments that are harder to finance period? Does anyone... it sounds like that, that describes the, 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 these uh, early investments that are, that are also most cost effective. I think, I think that's what I heard you say that those are also hard to finance sometimes. I'd say I, this is Louisa Ritu with Baltimore County. Um, I, I suggested some of this language at the very end of that sentence, partly just to remind people that these are the kinds of things that we need to be doing. And they're quite often things that have a very long return on investment. And so it's hard to justify, oh, I ought to replace the windows because it's going to take me 50 years to pay back, but it reduces my peak load, and then I don't need to worry about bringing as much energy into the building. So that was, you know, these are things that need to be remembered. So, Louisa, you're arguing that we should keep the text as it is. Yeah, I'm, I can get voted down, I'm sure. So. <laughs> um. Perhaps we could. Perhaps uh, we could. Mark, would you be ex okay with us maybe working with Louisa offline to try and uh, narrow the text a little bit, shorten it a, a sure, little bit? See, yeah, yeah. And I see Joshua has a hand up too. He may have some thoughts. Go ahead, Joshua. Yeah, thank you. Um, I like having this language in because it it offers concrete um, activities that are required during these phases, which I think help people understand the process. Um, and I think fine if, um, Louise, if you want to shorten it down, but I, I like the idea of having some um, description in there. Okay, it sounds like we have agreement that in principle this language is good, but maybe we can work with Louisa offline to shorten it a little bit. 
All right, um, uh, Tom, are you ready with your suggested text for the um, for the uh, uh, board above? Not yet, but I'll I'll um I'll put something in the chat if I get it. Okay. Stuart, All right, we're gonna move on. Stuart has a suggestion in the chat. Okay. Uh, Tom, I call your attention to Stuart's suggestion. See if is that is Stuart's suggestion acceptable to you? I think that's the passage I was looking for. So okay, great. Stuart. That's going in unless somebody objects. You yeah. yeah, sorry. Um, Stuart suggests, Stuart suggests uh, adding in that we're going to target uh, for special attention financing uh, incentives to electrification projects that would not otherwise result in strong returns on investment for building owners. I think that's straight from the task force charge. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good. I Very creative, Stuart. Thank you. Uh, sometimes the most obvious are the best recommendations. Um, thank you very much. We'll put that in there. Um, we're pretty much out of time. I think we... Go ahead. Just one quick point. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I clearly support this uh, approach. Are we going to leave sort of vague what an appropriate return on investment or return on equity time is? In other words, look, if, if someone doesn't get a return in a reasonable time where they will make money at the, in the out years, um, or if it's just impossible even to get a loan because the return is, is, is so low, I mean, do we want to jump in those very muddy waters or do we want to leave it general, I, I guess? I mean, again, we want everyone to move, and I think our original role was that the state should jump in where it's not economically feasible, which I think this captures. I, I appreciate that and, and the wording. Um, but I just want to throw out um, that more generic concern of when, who, and where do we make that judgment of what is appropriate and what's not. I don't think we have time to do that in real time now. If somebody wants to propose language on that, I think we could consider that and potentially put it in the draft that gets goes to the task force. But at this point, we are almost, this meeting's almost over, and I think we need to leave time for public that comment. That was more of a generic question yeah. for the future, and I don't even know what I believe in terms of <laughs> what, the, what the answer is. I don't want to take time now. Great. Uh, should we move to public comment now? We should. So there are just two recommendations that we didn't get to, which we'll need to get to at the last task force, at the final meeting of the task force scheduled for November 28th. So fund electrification projects for low and moderate income households and support BEPS compliance are two recommendations that we'll just need to, to work through in the final meeting and then bring uh, the final set of recommendations uh, and embodied in the final report to a, uh, to a vote on that day. Uh, are there any non-task force members that would like to make a public comment today? Being and hearing none, then I suppose then we can adjourn. Uh, just just before we adjourn to clarify, I think we have agreement on this uh, uh, section that we've just discussed, tax incentives. It seems as we're going to, Tom is going to, I'm sorry, we've incorporated Stewart's new language that came directly from the act um, that Tom is happy with. Um, and uh, we'll work with Louisa, maybe just shorten at Mark's suggestion, this bullet here, but broadly, no other changes, and this has task force approval, so it will appear black when we discuss it um, at the next meeting. I wasn't sure who decided to do the finance up front. I think we did. Oh, okay. All we, right. the, uh, the financing is will now be the okay. first um, right. priority recommendation. Okay. Thank you for that suggestion. Should we yeah. should we basically offer any suggestions that we have on the things that are new? Prior to your sense yes, um, we we are not looking for new suggestions here. At this point, we're looking for wordsmithing. We're looking, you know, if yeah. it, uh, it's wordsmithing in this case of something that's completely new that we haven't seen before. Right, so, right. Yeah. Um, should we also offer, just as we talked about putting the financing part at the beginning, whether we should order? I don't want to have to say prioritize order some of this information so that the things that are the 
greatest part of the charge task force are up front. Yeah, I, I welcome anybody who wants to make suggestions about what order the policy recommendations should appear in. Uh, we invite those, those suggestions. Uh, and can I just decide? Uh, <laughs> Or y yes, okay. the, the chairs can uh, can always pull rank on that. Um, uh, and Luke, you want to get a comment in before we adjourn? Yeah, sorry. Uh, so the uh, that second bullet for the comptroller's office to, to offer fiscal expertise. I, I'm wondering if that makes more sense in like a, a you know the one stop shop or the hub. Um, I mean, if it's if it's you know a required thing that it, the comptroller's office be involved. Um, that's that's one thing, and you know, I, uh, however that jurisdictional breakdown works out is fine. But um, it may be worth like making sure that's tied to that one-stop shop we had all talked about, um, so that com like you know a company who's trying to do this can really just like work with that one one entity to do a bunch of different things rather than jumping from you know the comptroller's office to you know the hub to the limited income funding folks. Um, Trying to consolidate that uh, could be valuable. Look, I think you might be misunderstanding. The comptroller is not going to be advising building owners. The comptroller will be providing advice to like legislators as they devise tax incentives, uh, may, providing recommended tax incentives that the state would adopt through through legislation. Does that answer your question, Luke? It does. Okay. All right, I think the meeting's ready to adjourn. Thank you, everyone. Very good meeting. A lot of discussions. Have a good one. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for you all who came in person. Thank you. There's some snacks over there. <laughs> Thank you for the brownies. <laughs> Have more. Yeah, thanks, Cindy, for picking yeah. up the snacks.